Hey, greetings, this is Fred in Alaska. Thanks for joining me. Um, hats are available on the website. Uh, all those proceeds go to uh, help filming the documentary. Um, as anyone who's watched this channel for a while, I, you rarely hear me even talk about the, the store on the website. Uh, that's there, you know, to help uh, support the documentary. So um, there's like stickers, t-shirts, hoodies, that, all sorts of stuff. It, it's it's there. Um, Subarctic Alaska Sasquatch.com. And uh, there's ways that they're contacting me. Uh, I mean, the description page for the channel has my information as well for anyone who wants to call. You can ask anybody and whoever responds. I talk to people all over, uh, not just Alaska, but literally all, all over. So, anyway, uh, what I wanted to share with you today is uh, some of the it's it's if you're an animal lover you may not like this um just be warned and if you have kids that love animals they may not want to hear it either um that being said uh so we'll we'll, we'll call him Jonah uh Jonah had a sled dog team that he ran when he was a kid uh, this was, gosh, over 45 years ago. Um, he asked me to leave the village out of it. So, Dave, this one, just uh, just pick a spot on the map and put it. Um, and we'll leave it at that. So, he was running supplies. And he, he was running between two villages. A larger village and his home village, which, you know, was roughly 100 people year-round. And he, he depended on his sled dog team. Um, he, it, it, he incorporated six dogs. And uh, he would use his lead dog to train the other ones as they came up and so on. And this particular lead dog he had, uh, he, he put in the lead because there was two younger ones directly behind this lead dog that he wanted to train up on the trail. Figured getting supplies, perfect time to have a bigger team, larger sled to get all the supplies I need and bring it back well so this particular trail you, you got to understand some of Alaska's uh, geography uh, it's you can easily be going across flat muskeg and then be into some thick hills with with thick timbers in no time that's just that's just how it is well this particular place didn't have a whole lot of trees but it had a whole lot of brush and when it snowed it would it it made trail riding and trail braking, especially with a dog sled team, extremely difficult. Um, so a lot of his time for the first portion of his trip was spent breaking trail and with dogs. And so uh, it, he admitted it, it was a lot of hard work. Uh, as he was, you know, of course he had a, a rifle for moose and, you know, whatnot. And that was about all the protection he had outside of the dog as you know all those dogs as an early warning system well this particular part of the trail he knew he was going to have a hard time with with the heavier load coming back with supplies he decided to go back and forth on it quite a few times and it it being winter time he knew his time was you know and the light was going to be kind of tricky so he pre-planned to stay the night at this other village where he got the supplies so he had daylight to travel by the next day to get the supplies home uh now on his final trip back through from packing down this particular part of the trail there's a there's kind of like a dog leg in the trail and as he was going around it this tree that was not of the area all of a sudden he sees this tree just come down on the trail like really hard he he said he felt it in his feet, heard a yep, and, and just dead silence. And the rest of the dogs were trying to pull away. Well, this thing had hit the dog so hard, it impacted its body into the snow and basically made a snow anchor while the other dogs were trying to back away. Uh, it, it happened just out of his sight, just as the dog broke that corner, whap, it happened. And... He didn't, he didn't know what the hell was going on at first. He just heard a, a really quick whoop, and, and then dead silence. The other dogs weren't making a noise. They were all wetting themselves and trying to back away. Uh, grant you, this 
the lead dog is pinned in like an anchor. So they're, they're, you know, they're trying to pull away, but really can't. He grabs his moose rifle. He goes trotting up there, try to see what in the hell is going on. And as he gets into view of this tree impacted into the ground and, and saw what was going on, he was kind of in shock, but off to his left hand side behind the brush, he sees dark movement immediately. He shoulders the rifle, takes a couple shots, boom, boom. Here's some screaming off in the distance, and he said he threw up. Um, he said he felt so oppressed with the, the air. He said the air felt like it was suffocating him, and, and it, it just, and the reality of what was going on, he, he threw up and went over after he was done throwing up, made sure he put a couple more rounds in the rifle and he goes over and, and cuts that lead line and so the other dogs could back away because the dog team was freaking out after he shot and the screams and, and all that so he writes the sled because with the dogs backing up and everything everything kind of rolled off to the side of the trail that he had just been packing and so he's he's trying to figure out what the hell he's gonna do like he knows that he'll get the dogs there that's that's not the issue he doesn't know why this happened what what was the purpose uh, he had been there probably a good couple hours going back and forth on this trail like you know why hit my dog why why do that and he still he still doesn't have an answer for it um I asked him, I was like, how'd you feel after the shock wore off? Like, you know, after you, you threw up and all that, uh, he said he felt like there was a thousand eyes staring at him and he had no, he, he kept looking around, you know, it, it, there was some brush and everything, but not a whole lot of hiding places as he put it. But so he, he gathers himself together. He goes over, uh, he guesstimated that the weight of the branch that impacted the dog into the, into the trail was probably about 350, 400 pounds because he just grabbed the one end and, and moved it over. It was a uh, beetle kill spruce and it was larger than what was available in his immediate area. He knew further up from where he lived, there's the bigger spruce trees. And so, you know, he's just kind of boggled, like kind of just trying to figure out what the hell just happened really because i mean he was in shock let's be honest um so he moves the log and he gets it clear enough for the dogs to to get by now he goes and grabs uh one of his utility blankets uh that he uses to cover the sled and whatnot and strap down when he has a load on it and rolls his dog up in that and um the dog the, there was it was it was ugly so he rolls the dog up, puts it in the sled, and he's already, it's going to be dark soon, and he's closer to the village he's heading to versus turning around and going back. So he continues on. Now, when he was in, going past this spot, um, he, he was riding his dog sled with his rifle cradled in his arms. He was kind of doing this number. And he was trying to get the, the dogs, encourage them past that point, but they were they kept sniffing the air and they didn't want to go further down the trail. Eventually he coaxed them and got them going. And once they passed the spot, the dogs were just hauling ass down this trail. With, I, I understand, he, they needed no encouragement that day. So he gets about a quarter mile to between a quarter mile and a half a mile because he, he's guesstimating because he wasn't in his right frame of mind. So once he clears this particular brushy area there's a little stretch of flats and as he's going across it uh the the snow is a little lighter in that area because with the wind blowing through it may snow a lot but then the wind blows and then it's you know eight twelve inches or whatever so it was good good running for the dog so he's going across that and as he's approaching the other side to where the muskeg ends and there's some more black spruce and, and willows and alders and whatnot uh he noticed in the in the trees this thing moving now he didn't get a clear description either time he saw it it was just a big dark figure moving through the trees right so immediately he stops the dogs and now this isn't that far from where this shit just went down so the dogs are 
automatically on it. They're sketchy. They're trying to they're trying to turn around, and he's trying to keep eyes on this thing moving through the trees because it's literally in front of him. He said about maybe 60 yards tops, and it was moving along through the trees, but it wasn't moving away. It was going kind of from from his left to his right. So he decides I'm gonna you know I'm gonna teach this thing a lesson and I'm going to shoot this damn thing well he gets his rifle and just as he's looking for this thing to get a beat on it and, and put some shots down range his dogs really start acting up really acting squirrely um they gotten themselves tangled up uh and he was getting no sight of this thing in the tree so he stops what he's doing puts his rifle on safety Stabs the butt end of it into the snow and leans it against the sled and is uh, pushing down on his little foot brake thing, trying to get his dog straightened out. Uh, has to take a minute, so he slings his rifle because he didn't want to leave it in the snow and it potentially getting lost or put it in the sled and the dogs take off and he's got no gun with them. So he slung it over his shoulder. Yeah, smart guy. <laughs> so he gets off the sled and he commences to untangling a couple of the lead dogs. Uh, the front two got hooked up behind the back one somehow. And so he's just untangling stuff. Meanwhile, keeping his head on a swivel. Now, as he gets them cleared and he pulls them back on the trail, the, the direction he knows he needs to go, the same direction he just saw this thing moments ago, you know, uh, he encouraged them, got them moving. And the closer he got, which the dogs weren't moving all that fast, they were not keen on going through this area, but they, you know, they're doing as they're told. He just starts breaking into the tree line, and that's when he heard the first scream. Now, when he hears the scream, uh, he saw nothing, but he said it sounded like it was standing over him. Uh, said it reverberated through his body, and uh, he threw up again. Um, from the stress, yeah, he 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 had heard of stories of the hairy man. He he's had uncles and and all sorts of relatives that have experienced just this type of thing. He just hadn't himself up until that point. Now, when when the scream happened and he pulled himself together, he said about twenty five feet away and about ten feet off the trail. So about twenty five feet up, ten feet off the trail, he saw something dark next to the trees now it's getting on into twilight in the winter now it's called alpenglow i don't know if anyone's ever seen it look it up gorgeous so he's got this creamsicle colored rose colored hue on everything from the sun starting to set so he's got this pristine beauty with this terror in the trees right over there so it, he said it felt like that moment lasted an hour, even though it was microseconds. It, it was just, you know, happening really fast. So he unslings the rifle. The dogs had stopped moving. As soon as that scream happened, the dogs parked it, wetting themselves again, just kind of just standing there like, what the hell? And he puts a bead on the dark spot, pulls the trigger. Boom! Nothing happens. He just thought it was weird. Puts another round in the chamber and takes a better look realizes it was just a part of a broken black spruce tree so he just shot a tree but in context with the scream and everything i don't i don't blame the guy i would have shot anything moving honestly so he composes himself looks around there's nothing the gunshot kind of broke the dogs out of their little stupor and he encourages them to go go so they take off again down the trail now he makes it through this particular part of the trail no other noises, no other sounds. As soon as it, he gets this sinking feeling, because um, like the last, he said it must have been the last 150 yards of treed trail before he broke out into more muskeg. He said he felt watched. And so he was looking off to his left and off to his right and all this, right? And the dogs are really moving now. I'm mean, They are hauling ass. And... It dawned on him when he was about 50, 60 yards from clearing the brush and the black spruce. Looked behind him. So he turns around and looks. And this thing is literally within 25 feet behind him, keeping pace with him. And he said he couldn't tell if it was breathing hard or if it was truly smiling. Because he said it looked like it had a big, wide smile on its face. Like it was having a good time. Uh, I don't. It, his words i'm just saying 
Uh, I would like to think it was breathing hard to catch up and not smiling in that. I mean, that's just malevolent. That uh, Anyway, so immediately he's freaking out he's encouraging the dogs go go and it, it it occurs to him as he's encouraging the dogs this thing could snatch me up at any time so he decides he's not going to look back because he's freaking out he said just in his mind's eye he could just picture this thing breathing on the back of his neck um i asked him what it looked like he said very light complected kind of a, a hue of gray real light gray not not super dark um said that it was very wrinkly around the eyes, flat nose, uh, big old wide jaw, appeared to be about nine foot tall, 10 foot tall, something like that. And and he's guesstimating that um, because the trees by where he had looked back, he knew they were eight to 10 feet tall and this thing was about with them. But one of the things he did mention is, is this thing's feet were sinking into the snow. So there was an, a distance unaccounted for there. It, regardless, it was big. So when he, when he clears and he's out on the tundra and he gets a little ways away, he, he feels the pressure, the fear uh, alleviating rather quickly. And, and he started getting mad because he, he glanced down at his tarp, his canvas tarp that his lead dog that he had for eight, nine years is rolled up in, right? And so he tries to encourage the dogs to stop because he wanted to try to get a shot on this thing. Because when he looked back, he didn't see it. It had stopped following him. So he was trying to get the dogs to stop. And once he did, he said he was about 200 yards from that tree line when they finally stopped. So he turns around and he's he's looking and he's trying to see where, where it may be. Off to his right hand side, off to the side of uh, the continued tree line that kind of wrapped around where he was at. He saw it running across there. So he turns, takes a shot at it. And, and realizes that it was moving way too fast and he wasn't going to waste his ammo. Continues on, gets his supplies. Uh, it had snowed overnight and uh, he used VHF radio to uh, give a warning to his family to be safe outside. Didn't say anything over the radio. Uh, didn't want to, you know, he just wanted to make sure that he let his family know he made it there safe and that they need to um be aware outside and, and take precautions and, and left it at that so the next day because it had snowed when he went back through there was no sign of anything no sign of the snow uh, or not the snow but the tracks in the snow uh very little sign of anything uh he he said it snowed so much he was damn near breaking trail again but instead of going back and forth this time he left it alone and just broke on through and, and went on home. Um, I, I, I want to thank Jonah, not, not his real name for, for sharing that. Um, cause it's something that traumatized him from almost 50 years ago. Okay. It didn't stop him from doing his stuff, but like, like I mentioned, I don't know what, when it was, but his, his, his passion for everything outdoors was just alleviated. It turned into work. You know, whether it be ice fishing, you know, cutting firewood, whatever it was, it it killed his his passion. And gosh, it it really sucks when things like that happen. Um, I I know the feeling, but I'm I'm no martyr or anything like that. But I get it. And there's a lot of people out there uh, that would be it would be foolish to discount. Uh, what these people share uh, especially like my experience what happened with me is not unique not even a little bit there are so many others out there that have had just terrifying things happen but not every single one is terrifying it it's the randomness of it like why why will some just shake and break a tree and make themselves aware and that's it while others will come right up to someone's cabin almost like toying with them i, I don't know just a lot of unanswered questions, but, um, yeah, gosh, anyway, uh, thanks for joining me and, uh, we'll catch you guys on the next one.